We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So um, the next speaker is Michael Chazan, story of fires, origins, interactions, and futures. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. First thing I want to say is uh, it's an honor to be here in all kinds of directions, but one in particular is just to recognize Polly and Matthias as someone who's a relative newcomer to working at the very southern end of the Kalahari. Um, their contributions, as you saw today, are just immense, and it's really a privilege to be alongside them. Um, so the first point I want to make, it's kind of hard. In 18 minutes, I'm going to talk about um, both fire and narrative, um, or narrative and then fire. Um, but the first point, uh, when I was thinking about this point of narrative, is I thought it was important as an archaeologist to, to recognize the tendency that we have to impose our narratives on the communities in which we work. I think this is uh, an element of our legacy as a discipline, and it's one that I think most of us in archaeology today are working, perhaps not successfully, but at least trying to overcome. Um, by listening to the communities with whom we work. And this is this cave that I'll be talking about quite a bit, Vondiver Cave in the Northern Cape Province. I'll show you where that is. Um, and this is a community day that we hold most days on, most years on Women's Day. And this is 2019, before COVID, and the cave fills with music, drama. We have drama performances. And um, uh, it's just tremendous to, to hear other perspectives, and I, I just think that that's um, very important to recognize. Now, narrative is, for me, an essential element of human cognition. To use a phrase from Carlo Ravello, narrative, narrative is one mechanism through which we blur time, which allows past, present, and future to emerge in orderly succession. From my perspective, a lot of what we do as cognitive creatures, as humans, is try to create coherence out of a lot of input, very incomplete input, and narrative is cr a critical component to that. Um, and I think that it's actually something that tends to be overlooked at looking at the world of the emerging child's cognitive realm that I think a lot of, well, kind of the way that Polly was talking about communities in general, how that fits together is done through narrative. Um, so in a way, before we tell stories to others, I'm the son of a psychoanalyst. Before we start telling stories to others, we tell stories to ourselves. Um, now, as an archaeologist, and I worry about saying this at the Salk Institute, I view narrative as a central part of the scientific method. And in fact, and this is the part I worry about saying, I very rarely test hypotheses in my day-to-day -day life as an archaeologist. Um, what I do a lot is test, construct narratives, 
test narratives? Do they work? Do they, could they be better? And I try to look at how the narratives that we've constructed can be confronted with the archaeological data. So the narrative that I want to talk to today is one that I've been engaged with for quite some time now, which is the narratives of how we came to engage with fire as a species, which, as we've heard, is quite central. So we'll start by introducing our protagonist and recognizing that it's a rather unusual protagonist. Because fire is not an element, sorry, you know, to our thousands of years of philosophy that said otherwise, but it's a chemical reaction. So it's a really odd thing to talk about when you really start thinking about it. Fire requires oxygen, heat, and fuel. And Something that um, has been written about, particularly by Stephen Pine, has brought this out very beautifully. Fire is part of um, the growth of and the development of Earth history. It's, it's as, as um, life emerges on Earth, you get the oxy oxygen developing in the atmosphere, and this interplay between oxygen and fuel and the emerging um, biomass is something that goes back hundreds of millions of years, um, long before humanity ever came on the scene. So that it's very important to understand fire as part of the natural environment. And as Pine writes about, and I think this is, there's some real beauty to this, that fire is the inverse of photosynthesis in a sense, that fire liberates energy and CO2, um, by burning, um, by, by ignition. So we can, in, we can appreciate that, the his, that, that fire isn't something that was invented by humans or discovered by humans. It's part of, it's a source of energy that humans have, have interacted with, chimpanzees interact with as well for that matter, um, so that we can think about fire the same way that we can think about hunting and agriculture, a way that humans have interacted and modified the environment. Another key point that flows from this is that fire does not, it, that fire represents only one aspect of humans' interactions with energy. And now my specialty is actually stone tools, and it's, you don't usually think of stone tools in terms of energy, but making stone tools, which begins at least 2.6 million years ago, as we heard, involves controlling the flow of energy to produce fracture, which breaks molecular bonds, irreversibly breaks the molecular bonds in, in materials. And you can see that on the right with conchoidal fracture, which is the kind of fracture that takes place in these materials in obsidian. And below that on the right, there's a picture of a hand axe, where each scar there is uh, a fracture reaction that's been induced by percussion. Basically a person hitting a rock, okay? Now th th that is the use of energy, and it's something that's very fire-like in that it's invisible. That fracture happens so fast you can't see it, right? It's an invisible force that breaks existing bonds. The picture on the left I just think is amazingly cool, if you will. It's a picture of an underwater um, eruption a couple years ago, and you can see that th it's this point of energy, that this is dissipation of energy flow that could be measured on an almost global scale. What humans were doing 2.5 million years ago was basically um, controlling that kind of energy on a much smaller scale. So fire is not the first time that humans have engaged with energy, but it's a significant one. The problem for me as an archaeologist is I can't find million-year-old fire. What we look for are traces of fire, and this is a picture of a fireplace a site in Jordan. If any of you have worked in the Middle East, drinking tea is a hugely important part of life. But what shows here, you can see the traces of the fire in the term in um, the form of the soot here, but also very importantly, the ash that's collected and is preserved where the fires actually burn. Okay, so there's one story about the origins of fire that violates some of what I'm proposing, and that's the cooking hypothesis, which sees fire as emerging as an event. It happened at a certain point. 
it doesn't say that it's an invention, but it does emphasize a singular moment around 1.8 million years ago when humans harness fire, allowing for the growth in human brain size, the spread of humans out of Africa, and whatever else you want to add on to that. I don't like that idea, and I'll come back to why, but ironically, the research teams I've been involved with have found a lot of evidence to support it by finding very early evidence of fire. I can't tell you how frustrating this is, but we get a lot of news play, so that's all good. So Vunderberg Cave is here in the northern Cape province of South Africa. It's in the savanna zone, southern end of the Kalahari Basin. This map here, we also work in the town of Katu, but that's for another day. Um, it's a massive cave. It goes 40, 140 meters into the cave. We're working here about 35 meters from the cave entrance. Um, the cave occupation goes down through a sequence of levels, the earliest of which is dated to about 1.8 million years ago, and that's pretty secure dating. Um, but I'm going to focus on a level around one million years ago when people were making very simple hand axes. This is what we call the Acheulean. Now, two of my colleagues, Paul Goldberg and Francesco Berna, used a method called micromorphology to understand the geological formation of the site. This involves taking out of the stratigraphic profile, the buildup of layers, taking a block of material out um, and then impregnating it in plastic so that you have a block that you can slice and look at under a microscope. So here we're looking on the right at a microscope, a, a microscope slide. This is an area of detail that we're going to focus in on. We're looking in at three centimeters of the site, okay? And this is what you have to do to find early traces of fire. Each of those black boxes is a place where Francesco and Paul identified traces of wood ash. That was very exciting. It's the earliest traces of fire known from an archaeological site. And it's clear that humans were responsible for introducing the fire. It's well inside the cave, outside, well outside of the zone that natural fires would penetrate. And subsequently, we found other lines of evidence, burned bone, and in this case, burned stone with these um, what we call potlid fractures. That's an A, and you can see that it matches D, which is an experiment of um, stones burned to 500 degrees. Um, there's also evidence from uh, rodent bones, or what we call microfauna, that are brought in as pellets from barn owls. They spit out what they don't swallow, and those lie on the floor of the cave, and in layers going back around 1.6 million years, we have burning on this microfauna. We have this um, uh, proven by multiple methods. Um, a slightly different project, very quickly, at Avron K Quarry um, in Israel with Felipe Natalo and his group at the Weizmann Institute. We were able to look at these stone tools. These are about a million years old. They were making very small stone tools, another interesting story, but none of these look burnt. So Felipe had a method using AI to identify Raman spectrographic um, spectra that were indicative of low temperatures of burning, something we've never been able to see. And lo and behold, there's burning at Avron Quarry as well, a site that I never expected there to be fire at. So I've been assiduously supporting the cooking hypothesis, even though I don't like it. Um, <laughs> but let me tell you why I don't like it now. Even though my evidence supports the idea of a human interaction with fire, probably going back at least 1.8 million years. And this takes us back to Vandeverk. Because here's the odd thing about the cave. There's fire. There is. It's there. There are stone tools. They're associated with the fire. But there are very few stone tools. And there are very few animal bones. And to find a fireplace, we have to take a block out and look at it under a microscope with really smart people who can identify this stuff. That's odd. If this is a base camp site like the, the Junquasi live in, we should find hearths. We're not finding that. So this leads me to think that maybe 
there's another way to look at it. Partly it's because of the evidence but partly it's because of the nature of fire. And we've heard so much today that I don't need to go on and on about this. Fire is complicated. It interacts with all kinds of different parts of our lives. It's not just nutrition, it's also technology. I'm still waiting to see how to make, use, make fire using a yucca stick, that's gonna be one outcome of this visit, but Fire is part of our social lives. We've heard about that beautifully. Fire is also something that embodies mystery, that it embodies the unknown. So shouldn't we expect that the emergence of this engagement with fire should be a long process, something that's ongoing and complicated, not something that's simple and a one-off? Why should the ability to make fire at will happen at the first encounter with bringing fire into a living space? Does that really make sense? And what makes more sense to me is a long prehistory of fire. And I'll give you a couple waypoints of how I think this narrative emerges. Yeah, by 1.8 million years ago, people are bringing seasonally available fire into cave sites. We can talk about why and what the value would have been, but they didn't have access to fire year round. Sometime around, as Polly said, three or 400,000 years ago, people start collecting fire but also maintaining it in hearts. They're still not making fire at will, but they're maintaining it, which also has social implications. My own view, although I can't prove this, is that making fire comes much later, sometime thing around 40 or 50,000 years ago. And also with that carrying fire around, which is also quite important. But then there are hundreds of other events. The invention of pottery, which happens at a global scale, not in one place. Developments of metallurgy, developments of ritual performances with fire. All of these are as important as what happens at Von der Ver Cave 1.6 million years ago. All of these are part of a long, complex, emerging story of human interactions with fire. So it's, it is truly a narrative, but it's a, not a narrative of you know, a force coming down and handing fire to humanity. Fire was always here and always, as you in California know, will be here. And this is the interesting part to me, is for the, one of the first times as an archeologist, I actually think what I'm talking about may be important. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was not meant as a joke, but, <laughs> but I'll take it. Um, now, what I mean by that is that we face over the next 20 years or so a transformation of our relationship with fire, it, it, with the end of the internal combustion engine and all of that. This is a necessary transformation of our relationship with fire. And if we believe that fire is essentially genetically encoded in who we are, and that there is a, a way that fire essentially must be there, then that's, break, that's a break, that's stopping us from moving forward. If we view the history of humanity as a constant experimentation with fire, well, then we're just taking the next step of a process that's been going on for two million years. But, it also means, what she showed us, is that it's not just about technology, right? That when we go in the next 20 years to transform our relationships with fire, which we have to do, it's complex. It feeds into all aspects of our lives. So thank you, I appreciate it. And